get ready. Close all your apps, grab your willpower by the balls, and prepare to do 500 pound deadlifts for your brain. From WASM Studios in San Diego, California, this is the Superior Men Podcast with your hosts, Matt and Jay. Today's episode Old People and Metal. Get it going, Matt. Most of my city listens to metal when I listen to metal. But what about you, Jay? You like metal? Oh, oh, I love it. It gives my brain something to hold on to. Word of warning, metal is not for everyone. Gam, 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 you need to die. We don't need you around anymore, you're a drain. I probably meant that in the nicest way possible. All that, much more. Hey, my podcast. And welcome back to the Superior Men Podcast. I am your host, Jay, here in the studio with my fellow host and superior man, Matthew. Good day, Jay, and good day to everybody listening. I appreciate you guys listening. I uh, love that you guys listen, like, share, uh, do all that good stuff. We appreciate it. Uh, please, if you guys can, drop us a note, a review um, on to whatever service you are listening on Uh so that would be fantastic. We would love and appreciate that. As always, share. Uh, if you don't want to leave us a review, I get it. Totally, totally okay with it. However, share us. Share us with somebody. You're like, hey, here's a you know somebody at the office. I I want I want them to uh, uh, have something good in their lives. Or like said, I, and I know I think I talked about this maybe last uh, last episode, a couple episodes ago, talking about. Uh, my previous, um, or when I was in an office, I had somebody listening to Phil Collins all day. Um, so you can listen to, uh, the Spirit Man podcast all day and just make your, uh, coworkers listen to that too. So, I mean, that that's better. The old, uh, the old saying that, you know, when I listen to le- to metal, so do my neighbors, you know, that's actually very functional. It actually, can... I, I say most of my city listens to metal when I listen to metal. <laughs> Put Osmo- it that way. Osmosis is a real thing. If yeah, you're, it if is. it's in the background, you're like, ah, I, I don't know if I want to hear that. But then after a while you're like, oh wait, these guys are actually pretty good. Uh, so you're, you're doing people a favor by playing this as loud a volume as possible. So That's share you, either voluntarily or involuntarily share it. That's what we're e- looking for. Here. Either way, you're doing the Lord's work. That's what we're <laughs> saying. Um, so also, uh, one, one other housekeeping note here too. Um, we are going to be releasing, um, a separate podcast, uh, we're we're calling it a bookcast. Yeah. Uh, so what what we're doing is we're taking some of our uh, our fun books that we love that w- that uh, we have been kind of suggesting up on uh, wearesuperiorman dot com. The um, w- uh, some of those books, and then we will be going. Where our plan is now is to be doing this monthly, but um, look for this to drop. Look for this to drop in June, um, and. Uh, so, uh, we're going to be, we're going to be releasing this just with several of our, uh, several of our favorite books. Uh, we're, we're kind of condensing stuff down to a no more than 30 minutes. I know if you guys listen to us, uh, Jay can get very long winded. Uh, Uh, and, and, um, I just, I just, I I have a, I have a lot to say. Um, but you know what the truth is? If, if any of you guys have ever listened to any podcast, like who does a half hour podcast? It's, yeah, it's, it's true. It's freaking hard. Like if we told Joe Rogan, "Hey buddy, so we want you to do a half hour po- podcast," he'd be like, "Fuck you." <laughs> he does a half hour of advertisements uh, <laughs> in in his 4-hour long podcast. <laughs> what and no dig, no dig on Joe. Like no, we we no. love I I love it. I love what he does and and I just look at this and I go, "I I don't know if I could record a 4-hour long podcast." So <laughs> I I I love it. No, so this is we condense it down to a half hour. We go through the book um, and just kind of give you a quick review of, of, of what it is and why you should. Uh, so we hope you guys enjoy uh, enjoy that. So that's that's coming. Like I said, look for that to drop in June, and we'll give you guys some more information uh, as we as we move along and as we move closer to it. So. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, we're looking forward to having a chance to do that. And it's the kind of thing where if you have always wanted to listen to uh, or or read a book, and that's the other thing too, more and more books now are audiobook. I know, Matt, do you even read physical books anymore? 
I, rarely. Yeah. I rarely do. I, I mean, I, I listen to most of my books, most of them. And if yeah. I read them, I usually read them on some sort of digital format. Um, and then uh, last for that would be reading a actual physical book that I hold in my hand. But that that probably is only uh, – it's a handful of books uh, that I that L- I do that to. Literally. Too. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Literally. Ha-ha. <laughs> Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's it's so much more convenient to be in your car uh, on your way to work in the commute and um, getting from point A to point B. And I, I actually have found that I really enjoy audiobooks in the morning when I'm um, running. I'm almost to the point where I, I have a marathon that I'm about to do here um, at the beginning of June. And I have to say that I don't really like running without having audiobooks and, and material in there. So totally distracts great... you from what you're doing the... too, because then you're paying uh, attention to that more so than music even. Oh, oh, I love it. It gives my brain something to hold on to. So, so these audiobooks um, are a neat kind of way to dig into that. And this is kind of excerpts and, and material from that book to kind of give you an idea of what is it worth uh, listening to? Uh, is it worth investing your time in? And so we think you guys are really going to enjoy that. So yeah, again, coming in, coming in June, the uh, Superior Men bookcast. It's going to be great. Awesome. Um, our- all right, Matt. What's uh, what's on deck today for our for our Superior Men podcast? What are we talking about? All right. Well, today uh, we're going to be talking about our uh, an an article that we have up, and we're going to dig a little bit more into it um, than than I think we did on the uh, on in the article on the website. But um, articles entitled "Ask Not What Your Country Can Do for You." And uh, really, we're talking about the politics of me, the po- me, me, me first, me, whatever, which is sort of where we've, uh, I will call it, where we've devolved into here, right? Um, me, 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 me. Yeah, me first, or I'm just gonna, I'm, a, I, I, I will vote, or we're we're gonna do a, a mob rule thing. That there's a lot of that that seems to be coming out of, uh, out of our politics recently, which. I, I'm just such a spoiler alert. I, I'm a uh, I'm not a fan um, of that. I I uh, just on the outset here um, and just before we before we dive totally into this. So just quickly, quickly for us and I know Jay and I differ um, at least a little bit politically. Um, my my tendencies are much more libertarian. Um, and or conservative is where I lean politically. So usually I go for um, smaller government. You kind of do whatever you want to do. Uh, so I, I guess uh, the 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 masses, the terms that most people would look as I'm uh, fiscally conservative, but socially liberal because I don't care. I don't care what you do. For example, like the victimless crimes. Uh, prostitution, drugs, whatever you you do, what you're gonna do. I don't care. Mm. I I don't. I have no issue with drugs. Um, whether or not anybody wants to do whatever they want to do with them, do it. Prostitution. Who cares? Uh, what you know? Why why do we have to criminalize something? Uh, if we are charging for it, but you can give it away for free. Uh, so that's sort of my my <laughs> issue there. More more like you know, it's just good business, right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I just here's some it. water. We can sell you. You yeah. can just get water from any tap, but we're actually going to sell it to you. There should be, you know, that should be illegal to sell water to people oh. when there's water everywhere, right? Well, right. I, I mean, that that's part of it. I mean, I I guess I just look and just go, hey, it doesn't really matter. Like. You do what you're gonna do. What two people do in their bedroom is up to them. You know, or four or five or six people, yeah, however many. I, I don't care. I really don't. It makes no difference to me. And it, you know, same thing to people talk about. You know, oh, gay marriage and blah blah blah. Who cares? But the government shouldn't be in the marriage business anyway. If two people want to, uh, you know, be together and and you know, be miserable together. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, no, I, <laughs> if, if you want to, I don't care. Really makes no difference to me. And actually I would say I would even go the other way too, for all, all you folks listening in Utah. Mm. Uh, if you want to marry, uh, if, if you as a dude, or well, I would say most women aren't this way, but as a dude, if you want to have like five wives and everybody's cool with it, fine. I don't care. Why, why does that matter to me? Uh, you know, that that's how I look at it. So um, that's sort of my, in general, what my 
uh, my big picture politics are. And uh, Jay, I don't know if you want to say um, where okay. where you sort of lean on those issues. I I would say fairly fairly similar on that. Um, not I would say. It, well, it's really, it's really interesting. I've actually changed a decent amount in the last decade or so here. Um, I think as you get older, just naturally, everyone gets a little bit more conservative. When I was younger, I was very liberal. Um, in fact, uh, before I moved down here to San Diego, I was fairly strongly anti-military. And after meeting a bunch of Marines, I mean, um, <laughs> North County, San Diego, I'm right next to the Marine base, uh, Camp Pendleton here, and getting a chance to work with a lot of Marines and, and Marine families and uh, spending time with them is kind of like, no, this this is actually really important for the country. And right. going and studying into it and realizing, okay, so law enforcement, I, which it was my my growing up perspective was fuck the police, you know, you know, the, the cops are pigs. That's it. That's right. the answer. And and now I get older and start to see more of how society functions. Then you start to connect the dots. It's real easy to have really strong political opinions if you don't know shit. <laughs> yes, um, it is. The more you know, Actually, the more look, you... look at a look at we have uh, we have a, a certain um, uh, representative from the state of New York who, uh, you know, look at look at her. She has no uh, she has no shit. And, you know, she she got elected into office. So, you know, there's that. Uh, uh, you, you don't have to you don't have to be a genius to be a politician. No, um, it's not a requirement. It really helps if you're attractive and you can speak well and you're passionate. No, like, that's those that's are... about it. Those are the important things, and we'll get into politics and and how people can kind of be manipulated a little bit later in here. But, but I would say, generally speaking, now uh, Matt, you and I are are fairly close um, uh, politically as far as that goes. Having having said that, um, I will say that one of the things that that both of us are frustrated by is how and kind of coming back to the topic at hand here, how the politics of each individual person, which we obviously respect. We're like, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever your sexuality is, uh, whatever your, however you want to do your finances, however you want to have your freedoms, like those things are, should be individual. The me first concept. If you take it too far, if you go the other direction, then it's like, we don't really care about anybody else except for ourselves. And that's a that's a much bigger problem. It kind of the, it swings the opposite direction. Well, but hist- what's funny though with the 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 topic there with me first is usually the me first attitude is at the expense of somebody else because I am all for you doing whatever you want to do. You want to front the risk and you know open a business or. You you want to uh, you know take your money and invest it into the stock market and uh, you know you could you could do really well or you could do very poorly. Um, that risk is up to you. So you know the way that I see it is like, look, we shouldn't be taxing people on uh, you know excessively on on certain things that they're doing, and we also shouldn't be rewarding people who have some sort of loss because there's. There's both of those in there. I don't know if you guys know this or you pay attention to the tax code all that much, but you can write off some of your losses in the market. You can also you are also taxed on your gains. So usually those things only benefit a a small subset. I just go, who cares? I would just say take that out altogether. We have a basic tax rate. You figure that out, you're done. You you pay it, and it's for the basic services and whatever. But we'll kind of talk about this. Let let's dive just just uh, a a quick dive into sort of the history of the me first politics and i'm really and and you know those of you listening outside of the united states uh i apologize because i'm not covering every other country i'm i'm covering the i'm covering the united states uh, right, wait if you're, i'm sure if you're... you guys all have some of this too you if you're if you're in in a country here outside the united states we know you have government uh, we know you have liberals and conservatives. Uh, we know you have people that are really strongly in favor of a centralized government and, you know, having smart people taking taking care of things. And then there's other people who are going to be going, you know, the government is a bunch of idiots. Um, <laughs> right. That, that, that's kind of a thing for pretty much humans. Right. Um, right. Having having said that today, uh, we are definitely going to be focusing U.S centric and specifically we're talking about the last uh 80 years or so 70 80 years 
kind of towards the end after the after the Great Depression and World War World War One, Great Depression into World War Two, at, at you know, and that was very tumultuous time, right for the we're, for the United States. We're kind of it's kind of like the beginning of where we're getting our feet underneath us as a nation, you know, financially on the world stage, like what what are we who are we up to that point it was kind of like just the u.s stays within the united states now what, you know, we broke pr- prior prior to world war one that was absolutely the case uh, we were not we we were a zero player on the world stage up until world war one and then you know we helped our allies and uh in a european war for world war one and we had that uh so then after world war one a a, a time of great prosperity in the 20s uh, followed by uh, a, a significant downturn in the 30s. Um, and then, you know, you talk about the New Deal, the acts that, that occurred, a series of acts that occurred in the 30s that uh, you probably all fell asleep uh, during uh, in history class in high school. Uh, <laughs> Matt was Matt and I were included. talking about that. <laughs> Matt, Matt, or, Matt and I were talking about that before the show here. And he was like, so re- tell me what you you know about the New Deal. I was like, Sorry, I, I just nodded off. Just you saying those two <laughs> right. words, like because in history class, which was uh, American history, was always before lunch for me in our high school. <laughs> like I'm sitting in the back, going, "Dude, just like I'm hungry, I'm tired. It's warm in here. This guy's just droning on and on." Um, it was back before PowerPoint. Um, back before you know much. Ooh, the, ooh, the slides, the the overhead projector with the yeah, transparencies, transparencies. <laughs> um, and and it was and all the cool people were sitting in the back the far far back so it was just like me and like six other people you know telling dick jokes and flirting flirting with the girls and and like i didn't learn anything so as soon as he said new deal immediately i got kind of like at a core level i got uh frustrated um and annoyed and bored right. um well but you know what's funny is now it's being brought up with the green new deal and we're like oh green new deal but obviously totally totally separate policies that are going in there but they're they're kind of naming that over this new deal probably one of the largest uh successes for social programs um in the united states and this happened prior to world war ii prior to our entry into it so we had all these programs where we were uh country was putting people to work because everybody was out of work so we went into some crazy deficit spending in order for this to happen it is what it is like so and and i'm not going to go into huge um expansion of what that was you can read it there's some nice parts where we do talk about uh or you can read some descriptors of exactly what the new deal was and and i touch on it briefly in the article um on the website which you can uh, read if you uh if you would like to there but really you know you have that, and then now we get into past New Deal, go to World War II. Um, you know, we have a significant boom in our economy post World War II, which you generally do after wars. Um, and you know, we basically had a an absolute significant shift in the world because you had all of this uh, advancement in the late 30s and 40s for military that kind of brought into the rest of society. Um, You know, you have roads everywhere. Almost every family in the 50s had cars. Cars were a common thing. Uh, You know, you could travel across the U.S. You'd take road trips and you could do that. You could go, you could travel across the United States or the world now on a plane and you know in in you know I, I was you know go back to Oregon Trail days right so like in the eight, <laughs> 1800s you're going across the country it's like well it'll take months and half your party is going to die you so, have, you've got dysentery <laughs> you have died of dysentery so you have that versus now you're on a plane and you get across the country in a matter of a few hours and uh you know it it's an amazing thing it's amazing time Obviously, we have the Cold War going during that time. Nobody ever talks about the Korean War that happened in the 50s, but that was sort of a surprise to everybody. Um, You know, there's a lot that happened in the 50s. Um, 
now obviously there's the 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 nuclear arms race that we're having so i mean like but basically the 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 people who were 40 years old uh in 1950 had a completely different uh life at age 40 than they did at age 10 their life was just not even the same probably couldn't even look at it being the same so there's some huge changes that occurred um and you know so we talked like you know so it's just sort of setting the stage for this you know it and one of my one of my favorite things where you talk about uh one of my favorite quotes and i actually just want to make sure that i say this correctly right is when we uh the good times hard times anyway well let me get the let me get the exact quote so i don't butcher it uh yeah yeah the hard times uh hard times create strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men weak men create hard times yes Michael that Hoff. fantastic quote on there too because hard times create uh, and i'm just gonna say it again hard times create strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men and weak men create hard times just look at the history since you know let's look at post world war 2 you know those were some hard times um and then i think beyond that you go well, i think we kind of created some weak men uh beyond that and, and it's this isn't a man woman thing just weak people and you're just so used to not having a hard time. That's why the fifties and we had the baby boomers and you had mom staying at home, tr you know, traditionally. Um, and you had everybody, uh, um, y you had this abundance that the parents of the fifties did not have when they were children. So they wanted to give everything to their kids. And now we've kind of created that, that baby boomer generation, right? And that baby boomer generation, those were the the hippies of the 60s and 70s and druggies of the 70s and 80s and 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 started going in there uh definitely changed the landscape of of the US so let let's yeah, talk about some of those changes jay yeah it really it, it, there's a lot of things that happened through that time but kind of coming back to what your that quote that you have there which is uh something that I, after first hearing it, I was like, wait a minute. That's just, that's so completely accurate. Everything is cyclical. Everything, everything comes in, in waves and the stock market moves up and down in waves. Um, wars come and recede, you know, it's just kind of like a real, you have a relationship. You have times where things are a little bit rockier. You have times where things are a little bit better. Times where things are a little rockier, a little bit better. Uh, the more, uh, if you're married to, or dating a Latin woman, there's, you know, the, the swings are a little higher. <laughs> but the concept is the concept is the same. Things go up, things go down, things go up, things go down. And when you're looking at the way our economy works in the last hundred years, um, after there's a war, <laughs> there's a big boost to the economy. We're excited uh, and things do well, except if you lose the war. Sorry, Germany. Um but yeah, not you, as it, not Japan, as big of a not as big of a boost. Japan, like things things go down, but even for them, then things turn back around after hitting rock bottom, and then they bounce back up. And uh, like Germany and Japan now have had uh, no problem coming back and becoming very strong uh, ex export world uh, world high level businesses uh, that you know major exports throughout the world. Uh, that is a that is a cycle. So same thing happened in World War One. We did really well, booming the the boom and the the roaring twenties, and then crash, Great Depression, because big problems there. And then World War Two, and then that that was really challenging, and and everybody had to dig deep, and everybody was donating all of their money and giving a giving away their rubber, taking it in so that they could make tires for. Uh, you know, various different oil products, everything that they could to, to donate to the war effort. And then after that finish and, and, you know, we are successful in the world war, then all of a sudden, you know, now America is thinking not just like we're great within our country. We're also thinking, okay, we're great on a world stage here. We expand our exports. We start spreading things out. We become more and more successful financially. And 
we are able to take care of ourselves when we're in that state, a mental state. Uh, we're able to provide for our family. We're able to provide for our communities. And that meant we can take that mentality and, you know, teach it to people. Now, the problem is if you are in a softer environment, like the kids that were raised during the baby boom, um, like you're saying there, Matt, they be, they're the ones that are like free love and hippies. And then, you know, some, some went into drugs and things like that. The, the impetus, the kind of sense of, um, you know, work ethic and the need to have these things. Like if you've ever met anybody, you're at this point, we're, we're talking something that's pretty darn old, but if you've ever met anybody that's lived through the great depression, and I remember my old boss, um, she was in her, you know, early eighties. This was, this was a little while ago. Um, but she lived through the great depression. Everyone that I know that's lived through the great depression, like they would save everything. They would right. hold on to everything. My grandmother used to like reuse all of her aluminum foil. Like she would, she would clean it off, fold it up, and then put it back in her drawer. I've because... even seen some use uh, reuse their paper towels. Same for and the same deal. They'll hang paper them up. Paper towels. Wow. Yep. Wow. Well, wow. I, I, so it's a thing. It, it's it, the mentality though is that look, we have a lot of things that we need to take advantage of here. We need to hold on to this stuff, and so when you start thinking about money. Uh, in in that way, you start thinking about resources in that way, then you realize that we actually do have quite a bit. As you become richer and richer, which is where we're at, you know, kind of fast forwarding here uh, to you know 21st century, we have more and more money available. We have more and more opportunities available, and really in an unprecedented sense. I mean, uh, and and really, what it, what is an interesting thing is there's there's two things. When government gets a lot of money, there are two things. There are two ways of thinking um, with with when government gets a lot of money. So uh, usually they run into so usually wars. Uh, re- there are some def- there is deficit spending that occurs during wars. And then the tax rates tax rates jump up either during or after the war in order to uh, lower back that deficit um, because of all of all of that deficit spending that was done. Right? It's it's sort of the same deal to you. Like you just think of yourself with a credit card. If you had to charge up everything on a credit card because you didn't have enough money during that time, fine. And then now you have a time where you're making more money. You're going to make a lot more extra payments into that credit card. Uh, so that you can pay that thing down. At least, ideally, that's the case, right? And it's the same thing with the government, just on you know a trillions of dollars level. So what happens once that credit card is paid off, and now you're still bringing in a whole lot more money? What do people do? So as far as the government goes, they uh, there's two there's usually two lines of thinking. Either we create new programs and put new things in place to spend that money that came in, or we lower the tax rate so that we are not getting as much money into the government because we don't need it. Now, that is just a general uh, thought, and that's usually just a who is in office during that time and who is who's been, who are the elected leaders at that particular time. Um Democrats historically have done have taken that well we got extra money so now we can spend it on these social programs uh Republicans historically and this is just uh, I'm I'm painting with an extremely broad brush over yeah, it's, that's oh, a, it's, it's a generalization for sure but yeah, on, over on, over a hundred years but typically on, then the Republicans yeah but typically the Republicans then would lower the tax uh lower the tax rates and have more of that money go back to the people. Now, there's pluses and minuses to both, and that's what we're talking about. So let, let's just talk about the history and stuff that has happened. So, you know, we had some big changes uh, post-World War II in the country where we um, enabled uh, very large entitlement programs, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So those are big programs um, the, and I, Social Security really was part of the New Deal, and uh, I'm I'm not diving too much. I'm not I, I don't want to split hairs on this, but that's really where this stuff came into into play. So you had, um, you had Social Security, you have Medicare, Medicaid, and these were designed as social safety nets for everybody. But as everything happens, 
Um, once you have an entitlement program, and that's what I'm going to call these uh, because you are entitled to it based on the government says that you can have this, um, they, they typically have a very hard time of going away once they're created. And typically what has happened is they get expanded upon. So if I start out a program saying you can get, uh, you know, this is only for, you know, this set of the population and that's how I get it passed and we go, great. Now, you know, I, I'm only giving uh, free or I'm only giving health care. So the Medicaid, Med Medicaid, Medicare for, you know, people who are extremely destitute or they're old and they can't afford um, what that private health care insurance would be. So we're, we're going to sort of help them out. If once you start that, you can expand that easily. I just go, well, I'm only going to give it to people who are over 70 or who have zero income. I, I, I'm throwing out things here. That changes over time. And those little changes go, eh, maybe, maybe 65, not 70. Maybe fifty-five. Well, because uh, you let's you, just give it to everybody. You <laughs> you run out of you run out of money, um, but then or or theoretically run out of money because then you have to beg and borrow and move things around. But then also the more people that go, hey, you know, we're we're getting older, like for Social Security, we're getting older and we're going to need help. People are living longer, uh, you know, for. For God's sake, we're just you, people won't fucking die, right? Um, Hurry so up and die, we, Gam Gam, Gam Gam. You need to die. We don't need you around anymore. What is this You're whole 80, 90 year old thing. This is this is not working. So, but uh, let's let's really quick look at look at Medicaid here. There's some interesting statistics, and uh, we have uh, we'll be linking to that in the show notes. So, 1966 is the first year that Medicaid existed. Uh, right. The en the enrollment four million people. Right, which makes uh, sense. Population of the country much lower at that time than it is now. Smaller. Uh, 67, 7 million. 68, 10 million. Um, slowly goes up. 10 years later, 76, we're at 20 million. So it's now 400% uh, bigger. Um, so stays in the 20 million range through pretty much the 90s. So from the 70s to the 90s, 20 to 30 million. Then in the 90s, stays in the 30 million range um, up to 2000, uh, 2002. 2002, we're now up at 40 million. And then something really interesting happens. From 2002, we're at 40, um, 30, 36 million in 2001, up to 2017. So the last 20 years, now we are at by 2017 last recorded full year data that that uh, government has here uh 73.8 million yeah almost 74 million people so we've we've more than doubled in the past 20 years on this particular program now just, good yeah, bad and different yeah however you want to look at it so it's you know it could be a demographic shift there's there's many reasons for it but when you have that, when you have all of the people who are in there, this is not a like a a, a greater good um, kind of system for for the U.S. where you could just go, oh well, you know, if I have ten million or if I have twenty million people in there, it makes no difference, you know, as far as like say for the roads, right? You you know, you have freeways out there. Does it matter really if you know ten million cars drive there a year or if? you know, 40 million cars drive there, the the cost uh, is not as significant, right? But if I double this for, say, health premiums, um, and we that's a, a, a clear um, jump in direct cost that we're going to have to pay. So uh, I don't have numbers down as far as like what, what we're spending on here. But just the, the thought is like, well, we need a lot more people in this. We have a lot more people in this program here, and especially within the past 20 years. And like I said, a big, big thing was probably the baby boomers uh, now getting up to that age and now getting into here. They're, they're a very large chunk of society. So, but that is a huge increase, right? So what, and, and, and why? Well, you know, why, why are people joining these uh, social programs like crazy. I mean, you know, we have tons of them. Um, so l let's let's take a another step back here. So I know we kind of went up to 2017. We we're talking about Medicare enrollment. 
But let's talk, um, and this is why I named the article the, the way that I named this here, which is ask not what your country can do for you. Um, and that is hopefully you guys know where that is, is coming from Kennedy's inaugural address, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm going to jump in here really quick. So yeah. the, the, the point of this, the reason we're talking about this and Medicaid is a good example, but you know, there are similar statistics for, uh, women, women, infants and children for the WIC, the WIC program, similar, uh, for various different, like, like the, the various different kind of like social assistance programs um, at across the across the board. Um, you as you look at those things go up. Think about it for a second. I mean, you got a twenty percent increase in Medicaid, and it's our our, our uh, like a hundred percent increase in twenty years for for Medicaid. That kind of take that representatively. We haven't had a a hundred percent increase in population in twenty years. Right. Uh, we haven't had a hundred percent increase in need in twenty years. That that has not happened. So, right. What what is the mentality? Uh, if we come back to that, reuse your paper towel thinking <laughs> about the world, um, and then think about what the United States perspective was, uh, at, in terms of like how it's trying to benefit the people around it. Uh, the the inaugural address 1961 for John F. Kennedy was a very powerful call to action because it it tried to and I think it really did distill down the essence of what it means to serve and take care of other people. It is a not not a like it's about me mentality. The question is what can you do for your for your country and and even goes beyond that most people only know that phrase that's not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country but it even goes bigger than that so matt matt read uh that kind of those three the last three paragraphs of this inaugural address and by the way if you're interested in reading it and you you really should we're going to include a link to it in the show notes here for the entire inaugural address probably take you you know five minutes to read it and it's worth it it is it is one of the the best speeches written in the last hundred years for sure. So, but yeah, Matt, read, read those last three paragraphs here. And, and one of the reasons why I picked this too, but right before I jump into this, this was pre most of these social programs. So th this is just like, this was the sort of mainstream thinking at the time, 1961. So coming right out of the fifties. So this don't, don't think of this as being like, Oh, this was the free sixties. No, this really wasn't the hippie sixties weren't till, the very, very end, you know, 68, 69, like that's really what that was. But so this was really sort of that uh, that baby boomer 1950s mentality. And I think it's distilled real well here. So, again, last three paragraphs, starting with the one that all of you guys know. Um, and so my fellow Americans ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you, with a good conscience, on, uh, only our only sure reward, with history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. And what I like here is it's saying, look, fe fellow Americans, this is it. Now how about f uh, citizens of the world? Here's something here. Now everybody, whether either one that you're a part of this here, like, look, what we need to do is we, you know, even, and he's referencing his and God by, he's referencing God by this. Um, Kennedy was definitely, uh, well, actually, I think he was the first Catholic president. Yes. Um, and so he was a religious man. But one of the things with this, too, is just he's talking about, look, we need to do this. We have to work. We have hard work to do in order to do this. And this is definitely in the midst of the Cold War. So there's, uh, you know, some historical context you need to look at this too, but very important. Like, look, for all of us here, don't don't look at the country and go, hey, uh, will you owe me this? 
Um, don't, and then for the world, go, ah, America owes us this. You know, what we need to do is we're asking all of us through our strength and sacrifice, um, and we're just saying the your only sure w- reward is going to be basically the benefit to yourself of knowing you did a good job. That's what he's saying. And I love it. It's it's fantastic. It's a fantastic speech. It's a wonderful speech, and I'm I'm glad you included it. It's a, a great title and concept for for the article here, and worthy of much more conversation than we're investing on this topic. I'm sure we'll be coming back and referencing things, uh, this this topic and similar topics as we go forward here. For sure. But this is so this is so valuable. And kind of coming into the next section here as we're talking about the entitlement programs and how that started to change, the self-reliance concept that America was, like, we were the cowboy uh, nation, you know? We're the the, the Wild West, uh, we're the industrialists, we're the inventors, uh, we're the people that change and and figure things out and do what we need to do. We're, you know, we're taming the wilds, like, we're well- taming the savages, and we'd been we'd been built on too for our whole country, which is just like you know why everybody uh, historically and still wants to come to this country because you know it's the land of opportunity. If you work hard, you'll get there. You'll yes. do it. Where there are you know if you've lived in the bubble of of the United States your whole life and you haven't gone outside of the country, um, there are many places in the world where it doesn't matter doesn't matter how hard you work. Uh, you, you know, like you look at the caste system in many parts of the, of the world where it's like, look, uh, your dad was a shoemaker. Uh, his dad was a shoemaker. Uh, they were shoemakers uh, forever. And that's also what you are going to be. Uh, you, you don't have a choice or an option to be better uh, or to change it. That is what you are going to be because that is what, what you what your family has done forever so it, it, it's those sort of things where now you could go, you could say well i've been a you know my family's been shoemakers for 500 years but i'm going to come to the united states and i want to be a farmer great you can go and get land and be a farmer you know that was sort of what we did and it it is a it's an amazing thing and it's a concept that is uh sort of different for the compared to the rest of the world. Well, and I I think we have brought a lot, the United States has brought a lot of that same kind of thinking to the rest of the world and going, okay, this is how to do it. Um, Right, right. And and, um, certainly these are not, it's not America-centric. And in fact, you know, using that concept of um, America-centrism, you know, U.S.-centrism, it can, that's started to change. What is the core of the country? So that, kind of brings us into the next section here so if you get to a certain level of success and a certain level of satisfaction and it really a certain standard of living you get to the point where you realize i really like this (laughs) yeah right uh it's it's kind of the reason why military coups in other countries start usually supported the military dictator who was you know now this a uh, horrible bastard who's decapitating people right and left and ruling with a bloody iron fist when he first started out he was taking out another guy who was horrible and he was supported by everybody because they're like finally this guy's going to get out of here and we'll be able to get somebody somebody who's uh, going to bring peace and justice and you know he's strong enough he's a military guy so he'll be able to do what needs to be done that guy gets in power and he wins the the popular vote he wins the election because everyone's all 100 percent on board you know and then after you know four six eight years or so he's had all the power and he's got all the women and he's got the big house and he's got all the jeeps and he can go hunting with jaguars um on you know in his own 500 acre game preserve and he's like i don't really want to give this up actually yeah, that, and then I'm, I'm, and then he he gets his political rivals, and he's like, yeah, I think I'll I'll probably uh, disembowel them uh, hanging upside down too. Yeah, and put that and put that on TV. Yeah, Why not. Yeah, because so, because so I'm then, comfortable in this yep. situation, and uh, and I'm I'm not going to compare being in a dictatorship to being on uh, full government assistance, but it kind of 
is a little bit. Well, yeah. So let's let's talk about the, the entitlement programs uh, here. And I say I, I give kind of three things, right? I love it. the the good, the bad, and the ugly for our entitlement programs. So there's there's no matter what, and I don't care where you are uh, politically leaning. There is there is usually three parts to whatever that entitlement program is. So uh, you know the good part. Obviously, the 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 there's an altruism as part of it. We're like, look, we're trying to help people. We're trying to these people are X Y Z, right? They are poor. They can't go to college. They can't whatever. You're old. Like yeah. you're you don't have the you don't have the facilities. You're disabled. You right. You don't have a leg. So there's you're there's blind. so yeah any of those things. Whatever the thing is, you just go look. This is that's the good part of whatever that program is. Uh, the bad, the bad part about, uh, about it is that you're usually, uh, doing it to the politicians are doing it to increase their power base because really that's, that's the bad part of it is look, vote for me. Uh, and you know, uh, I, I gave the analogy too right in high school. Uh, if you remember in high school the uh, the the elections, right? You have your your class president, <laughs> you're you're voting for your class president or the school president. You know, it depends on uh, on how big your school was or whatever for hi- for high school. But it's like, all right, so that that class president's going to be like, vote for me, and I'll make uh, you know summer break twice as long, yeah, you know, and then it and then you're going to do that. And people, you know, obviously it's tongue in cheek uh, for sure, but you know, because they don't have the power to do that. We're gonna but, give. We're gonna get. We're gonna put. Uh, we're gonna have a party every weekend. Uh, yeah, pizza, 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 pizza party pizza, every Friday. Yay. Pizza party every Friday. We're gonna do. Uh, we're, and the principal's dan- gonna pay for it. <laughs> we're gonna have. Da- we're gonna have a, an extra dance. Uh, limos are gonna be picking up everybody this year for you know prom. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. We guarantee a, uh, a limo for everyone. Yeah, limos or, for all. You know, um, <laughs> we're we're bringing we're bringing gifts back. Uh, we're gonna have the the kissing booth, and only the hot chicks are gonna be in the booth. I'm gonna vote for this. Yeah, this is yeah, this is fantastic. Let's put this. But in here. you know, but really, with our politicians, they'll do that, and they go, "Look, vote for me, and I'll make sure that uh, you know, for all of you who are poor, I'm gonna give you you know five thousand dollars a month." And then all the, you know, the poor people would be like, yeah, you got my vote 100%. Um, And then the other guy who's like, no, man, you need to work harder. Uh, Those people are like, yeah, fuck you. Um, (laughs) I'm going to go with the guy who's going to give me $5,000 a month. (laughs) I I mean, like a thousand dollars a month, right? I mean, yeah, I'm, well, really, that's that's I, I mean, you're 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 obviously exaggerating a little bit on that one. But but really, though, you're getting that money. And then that leads us to the ugly part. So right. you get the you get that. OK, so I'm I'm making a thousand dollars a month because Free. I don't have access to no, all not. the resources that other people do. I don't. And, have it, and it ends up ex- being a it and, ends up being like, a oh, you 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 do deserve this because you don't make much money so here's the thousand dollars you deserve it you the have government more children is, you have yeah. you have four children so obviously you need some money to take care of those children and, right oh look no you just had a fifth kid uh i can uh, see it, i can see it right. merging right now here's another thousand dollars a month <laughs> right right um and so if as you use more and more of the systems you can you can call it entitlement programs assistance uh, assistance programs is kind of more what most people think of when they when they look at those programs. The idea is we need a little bit of help, you know, just a little sure. bit of help, uh, not a lot, just a little bit. But as people, as you get to the point where you're using that, not just for a short period of time, but kind of ongoing, you get comfortable with it. You get comfortable with that that lifestyle. You get comfortable with that money coming in on a regular basis, and you start going. I kind of feel like I need this. You know what I mean? Like, well, right then, then you just budget accordingly, and then you just like, well, now I get this extra money. So then you have somebody going, well, I want to end these programs or whatever. You'd be like, yeah, no, no, you're you're not taking my money because that's my money. So I'm gonna vote for this other guy, and it it sort of then it, you just sort of create this victim mentality. You create this victim thinking amongst these people where they're like, well, I need this money, so. 
I need to vote for these people so that I keep getting this money because I can't live with it otherwise. And it's just then it just kind of goes from bad to ugly, bad to ugly, and just kind of keeps it going there. And the other thing, too, that ends up happening is those programs cost money. So not just in the direct cost of that $1,000 that we're giving. So for any of that $1,000 that we're giving, if you think that the government is uh, uh, efficient, um, then uh, you've never been in government. Uh, <laughs> government is – so for – and these – I'm just throwing out numbers. I would imagine for every $1,000 that they give out, there's probably 200 to $500 uh, that is baked into that program that they're using for government employees to fund that thing. So whatever the money is that they're giving out, there's a lot more that's being Administrative brought in costs. on. Yeah, that's being brought in on overhead for everything. So you know, it's a really bad thing. But really, what this does is it just just perpetuates that I'm not going to work hard. Um, so that's what it is. And I and I I went through a scenario that. I I wish that there was some hyperbole in yeah, this. Yes, you were I, talking about this as something that actually I cuz I honestly as you're saying as a scenario in your in your article, I uh, I was like, okay, I could see that as a thing. I didn't go up and look up all the numbers, but I'm like, okay, you know, as a, a theoretical, but you said this is this is actually what happened. So I plugged personal in numbers. Yeah, no, so not personal, okay. but like taking these calculators online and doing them. So this is okay. not at all uh, like, oh, I'm just kind of throwing out some numbers like like what I just have been. These numbers are legitimate. Like, I these are from calculators, from government websites. If you want to check out our article, you can see, and I've linked in, in there um, as far as what those are. So if I am earning $2,500 a month, so this is also in California, so that, that's where I'm, I'm doing this. Your, your, your mileage may vary depending on where you are, but this is true in California. So if I'm earning twenty five hundred bucks a month via my job, so I don't know what that ends up being. I'm I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Yearly, yeah, no, a year. I don't know what that ends up being. What isn't that like thirty grand, uh, roughly? I think do, yeah, yeah, count, 20, do, 28, 28. Okay, so twenty eight grand. So that's r- like not fifteen dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just so you're sort of looking at what that is. So. That should be um, an entry level type job. So, say no fault of your own, you were you were let go, you were fired, whatever, or uh, whatever. But for whatever reason, you are you're not working there anymore. So, what are you gonna do? Uh, if you file for unemployment, um, you would what you would end up receiving for your benefits is about nineteen hundred dollars a month in unemployment benefits. Um, that is more than you would take home from working that 40 hours a week. So Mm. when you're working and earning, so again, that $2,500 that I'm talking is before taxes. That's just your, your earnings. And you know, at that tax rate, because that's what I figured out through with all of this, you're actually going to bring home, say just under $1,600, uh, at that, you know, $15 an hour job. But you get on that unemployment, you're going to take home 1900 and your income is zero, which means that you qualify for every other social assistance program that is out there. So you could get, uh, if you have a child under five, uh, you could, you qualify for that WIC program. So you would, you get a lot of food, uh, for free. You would qualify for other kinds of government assistance where you could get uh, food stamps or whatever the, the health, nice health term care, for it is now. Healthcare as well. Yeah, healthcare. You get healthcare for free. Huh. All of that stuff. And now, and for what? You're making more money. You literally are making more money given that example there. So, what is your incentive to go back to work? Um, probably not a lot because I'll just ride this gravy train out as long as I can um which then now that makes it even that much harder to get another job it's like well you've been out of the workforce for you know a year or whatever a year and a half why what have you been doing and it's like well I've you know been contemplating my navel and uh did really good uh let me talk about it uh so um 
<laughs> I've been playing a lot of World of Warcraft. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be I'll be honest. I'm pretty yeah. excited about the fact that I have I have watched every new show that's come out on Netflix for the last two yeah. months. Every one. Of I them. have, and they're fantastic. So I'm great at at the gossip at the water cooler. If that even <laughs> is a thing anymore. But. <laughs> You know, so you have all of this, you know, not to mention you qualify for a free cell phone. I mean, there's all sorts of things you get now. And like I said, now you go back to work and just to now your lifestyle is adjusted to uh, according to that 1900 plus all those fringe benefits you're getting. So now in order to meet that, you need to get a job that's probably paying you more like 3500 or 4000 a month. And you don't qualify for that. So now we've just created this vicious cycle. Like I said, it, I I do research for all of my articles, and both Jay and I do when when we're looking at stuff. This one, I I literally s- stared at the computer as I was doing this, and I was like, I I don't like I don't believe this. I I it, it, this is it is hard to believe that there is a there is a safety net. That is not a safety net. It is a ladder upwards. That is what the safety net is. The safety net is not like we're going to help you, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, this it's not a safety net. It's like, oh, you got fired here. We'll 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 bring you up. We'll bring you up a little bit. You're actually uh, going to go. You're going to go in in an upward direction. And right. Th- it completely and totally removes your momentum. It removes your desire to your, your ambition, your desire to go and, and create and build and have your own life stand on your own two feet. Um, it makes you dependent on, uh, it, well, on... There's it. There it is. No, no, no. That's your big one. It makes you dependent. It, you are now not... You are not an independent functioning creature at this point. Now you are completely... You're a child again. You're 10 years old. Yeah. That's what you are. And mommy and daddy... Uh, are instead of mommy and daddy, you have mommy, you have what Uncle Sam paying <laughs> for everything. So right? these things, this assistance programs, these and 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 they can certainly uh, morph from assistance programs into entitlement programs. These are designed for hard times, for short. Well, that's what they uh, should. That's what they should. Be. That's what they're designed for. That's what they're supposed to be for. Uh, and the, but this is the truth. If you have an iPhone, you don't need food stamps. Right. Yeah. Right. If you have a, if you if you have anything but a beater car, if you got I I know some people that you know if you drive through certain neighborhoods like certain really poor neighborhoods, uh, and you see like new cars in there, you can get a lease by the way of a pretty decent car for but if you manipulate the the various checks that you're getting, if you have a new car within the last three years, uh, you don't need Medicaid. Uh, you, if you have a big TV, you don't need, uh, women, infant, children. You don't need this stuff. It is, it is not necessary. It is time to like get your self-respect back. (laughs) And And, as, as as that's exactly it. Yeah. The whole across America, that's the plan. That's, that's the goal. Like if, you know, (laughs) if we were to have just on across the board, everyone that has lived through the great depression, like could see where a big chunk of America is is living and how they're living, they would take those uh, used up aluminum foil and paper towels <laughs> and beat the shit out of us with them. Well, and the, and and we would we would all deserve it. And that that's really the thing. It's like, look, you should be these. Uh, and I this is what I said. Like all, I guarantee you, every single one of the, like these these programs that have all that have all started, they they started off as being much less and then it's well we'll just up the limit a little bit we'll just up it a little bit more after all we're helping people after all blah 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 we're doing better whatever the case may be and then now you end up being as instead of it being that uh you know that helping hand like just in case uh you have now removed motivation for like okay so i get fired and then what i mean really that's that's the case. You you and gotta then what? You gotta you gotta get to well let's 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 talk about it right now here. We're coming up to the to the end of our time for uh, this podcast. There's so much to talk about. There really is. Um, let's let because we're big into action here. We're uh, the Superior Men podcast and uh, the We Are Superior Men just 
just our our ethos is like be superior you we can do better than this so matt let me ask you so you got this program that you're on you got this these attitudes and these perspectives of the world uh but you want to change uh what can you do what can you do in your life how can you start making making a change from this and going from the the me first uh movement and that perspective into a like what can you do to serve other people to serve the community to serve uh serve the united states serve the greater good and really serve your own soul what can you do and, and really what i say for that is you need to be doing stuff you need to be preparing and working and looking at things for for yourself now uh, i have looked at my whole life as social security not being there um so yep same and 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 I don't know. It may it may or it may not be. I I don't know. But that doesn't matter. I'm preparing for that on my own. So I'm preparing for my eventual retirement on my own, so that I will be able to take care of myself without having that. And if something happens, you get laid off. I get it. Like I'm I'm a hundred percent with you. But just because the government says that they'll pay for your unemployment for 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, doesn't mean that that's what you need to take. You know, my thought is, is if, if I were to get, you know, my boss calls me, you know, right now and they're like, oh, you're fired. Okay. I will have a job next week. That's just the thing. Like, will it be everything that I want? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. But I will, I am not going to be sitting around, uh, and wallowing, uh, in my misery, I, it'll, it'll happen. I will make sure that it is taken care of. Well, because there are so many opportunities that are available. And, and I just, you, exactly. You need to take advantage of what's out there, your opportunities. And those shouldn't be like, well, what can people, what can somebody do for me? It's what can I do for myself? Or, you know, can I go out and get that job? Now, like I said, it's there if you don't, you can't, you're unable, whatever, you know, uh, uh, something horrible happens. I, I get it. That's, we're good with that. I'm good with the stuff like when you need it, use it. If you don't need it, don't use it, even though it's available to you. That's what, and that's that part of being that superior man, doing it on your own. Yes. Doing doing it for yourself, being and and being self-reliant. It, it's it, I saw this quote on uh Twitter, I think, and um it, it just sort of summed it up for me. It, all that it is is there's a motivation. And if if there's no motivation, you're not going to. So I saw this one there's a guy who uh does online businesses and whatever and he said uh, you know, if I were to kidnap your, you know, wife, mother, children, whatever, and I kidnap them and I, and I say in, you know, 30 days, I'm going to execute them, uh, horrifically. And, uh, so there's your motivation, right? So if I'm going to do that, um, the only way that I won't is if you make $20,000 working, uh, or, or via an online business this in the next 30 days, there's your sufficient motivation. I think anybody is capable of doing that. The The point is, is that if you had sufficient motivation, you could do it. So if that's what you were trying to do, you could get that done. I guarantee you, uh, you would be able to, to succeed at that. So if you needed somebody kidnapping your uh, your wife, <laughs> your mother, your children in order to do that, when you could do it, you can do it. So get to it and do it yourself. Like don't you don't need that extreme thing in order for that to happen. Work on it. Always be out there searching. You have a great job, awesome. You should still be looking to see what else is out there. Always. Yep. yep. Always. Yep. That's what you're saying is is fan is fantastic stuff. I'm going to add to that a little bit and that is uh I want to say you need to get stronger. You need to get harder. Uh you need to start teaching yourself. We we're talking about it in a, in a previous podcast and, and mentioned it multiple times. This concept of embracing the suck. Life is hard. Get used to that. 
get used to this concept that things are not going to go comfortably put systems in place to take care of that when they go bad get that savings account going yep uh get your uh you know have some friends know that if things go bad like you can rely on them help them also so that they can work with you help putting other programs in place to take care of your community. You know, if you're connected to a church or charity organization, work with them, help them and help other people around you to start thinking about this stuff because it's it's something that we have control over, but it's really more about little things for for most of us. I mean, if you're having trouble with your credit cards, I don't care how uncomfortable it is. Cut them up. Cut them up. If you're fat, if you can't stop eating, you know, get it out of your house, man. Get the crap food out of your house. Start disciplining your yourself. If people around yep. you are treating you badly, uh, leave. You know, yep. Don't start, take have it. a fight. If you need to have a fight, stop letting yourself be disrespected. For your kids, set boundaries when necessary. In, enforce those boundaries with punishment. Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm not saying like like beat the crap out of them, but. They need to know that you are in charge because the whole concept of life is that, look, things that are going to happen that are bigger than you and you're going to have to deal with those things. And that's part of the job of being a parent. You help set something in place and go, okay, the kid doesn't want to do this, but he needs to do it. And that's what life is going to do. Sometimes you don't want to have to deal with these uncomfortable things. They're still going to happen. So if you can prepare yourself, strengthen yourself mentally and emotionally, uh, and and as often as possible financially for when shit hits the fan and when things that can go wrong, as, as everyone knows Murphy's Law, anything that goes can go wrong will go wrong, then you will be like head and shoulders above everybody else. And then ideally, you know, as you're as you're becoming the superior man and, and you know, holding on to that ethos, you can take that and share that concept. Other guys around you will see that and go, oh, well, that's better than what I'm doing right now. Like, I, I want to do that. I want to be that. I mean, Braveheart is probably one of the most popular movies of all time for guys because you look at this guy and go, like, I want to be like that. Like Robert the Bruce yep. looks at him and goes, I want to be him. I want to be like that. I can do better. Like I'm doing this. It's what everyone else is doing. All the nobles are doing all this. Like they're taking advantage of other people and that's how they do it. I can do better and we can do better. Uh, so that's, that's where we can, that's where we can go. It, the, the point is we can, we can make a difference and it doesn't have to be me first. We can help our country. We can help our families and our communities. Uh, so Matt, final words. Well, no, thank you. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you like it, like subscribe, share with others, appreciate it. Look forward to the, uh, the book cast coming out here, uh, in June. So, um, as always stay superior. You just listened to the superior men podcast. If you enjoyed our show, make sure to subscribe so you can hear all of our best content. And if you want to help your friends get smarter, make sure to share this episode with them. For more information about this podcast and hundreds of ways you can upgrade your life, visit us online at wearesuperiormen.com. Remember, gentlemen, live superior.